Open your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of John chapter 4. The book of John chapter 4, and we'll, we'll be looking at the passage that that song is based on. And the reality is that the only thing that can satisfy your soul is Jesus. We try so many things. We look in so many different directions for satisfaction, for fulfillment. Well, I want to tell you that your fulfillment, your satisfaction, the deepest longing of your heart cannot be satisfied in a human relationship, as wonderful as those can be. Real satisfaction comes from your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our sermon is about today. That's what the text is about. That's what our singing has been about, that it is the Lord Jesus who makes a difference in our lives. It is Jesus Christ who brings satisfaction to life. Would you stand with me, please? And may our standing reflect our honor of God's Word as we look today in the book of John, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made uh, and, and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gaveth us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I may thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidest truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit. They that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. Our Father, we thank You for the reading of Your Word. We pray now, Father, that we might receive it, welcome it into our hearts. And today, Father, we pray that someone here without Christ would believe on Him as the Son of God and the Savior of their, of their souls. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. In John chapter 3, Jesus spent an evening talking about spiritual things with a prominent Jew named Nicodemus. Those spiritual things seemed to go right over the head of Nicodemus 
For he did not get a spiritual grasp of what our Lord was saying to him. Here was a man that was religious, but he was lost. Here was a man that was uh, uh, noted for his knowledge, and yet he was lost. Here was a man that had it all going his direction, or so it seemed, and yet the Bible says that he was lost. We just turn the page of our Bible, and we come not to another religious man, but we come to a woman. But not just any woman. She is an immoral woman. She is an ungodly woman. She is clearly and obviously a woman who is in need of salvation. May I say to you today, dear one, that not only do religious people need salvation and religious people need Jesus, but immoral people need Jesus as well. Whether you are religious or whether you are immoral, you need the same Jesus. Well, I have an idea. I have an idea that people like this Samaritan woman, she's nameless, she's faceless. Nobody knows her name. We don't know a lot about her except what's right here in the text. And yet she seems to be open. She says, give me to drink of that water. Then on the other hand, there was Nicodemus who wanted to argue. How's that going to be? How's that? How, how, how can I enter the second time in my mother's womb and be born? You know what? Very, very often it is easier to win an immoral person to Jesus than it is a moral person. Because like some of you here today, perhaps some of you watching this telecast are, are, are trusting in your morality, your perceived morality. You think you're okay. You think because you've been raised in a church, because you've observed some ordinances, because you are a good neighbor, a good husband, a good wife. You think that somehow all of that covers you in your standing with God. In the eyes of God, you are exactly where this woman was in need of a Savior. Do not today trust in your perceived religion. Do not today trust in your perceived morality. Trust in Jesus. Salvation is in him. So I want us to look at this uh, chapter together today very quickly. And and notice what um, the Lord says. This chapter uh, has at least three movements in it that I want us to look at today. Jesus said something to the woman. Jesus said something to his followers, and then Jesus said something to the multitudes. So I want us to look at those three uh, times that our Lord addressed these three different groups. First of all, what did our Lord say to this woman? Now, now immediately you notice in verse 6 of our text that, that Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, because the Bible says there was, a, there was a well there, and Jesus sat down and rested. That is the humanity of our Lord. Never forget that while it is true, while it is infinitely true that Jesus is God in the flesh, he was still in the flesh. What that means is that our Lord, yes, he had the power of deity. He had the, he had the ability to demonstrate the power and the glory of God. But it also means that Jesus in the flesh had the ability to get tired. He was the God man. And here's a demonstration of the humanity of our Lord. He is tired. He is weary. And the Bible says that he sat on Jacob's well, uh, at Jacob's well and he rested. He was human enough that he could sit down and rest, but he was divine enough that he could redeem a sinful woman from an immoral lifestyle. So while the majority of this text is taken up with the conversation that Jesus had with this woman, notice first of all what Jesus saw in this woman. By the way, in this conversation, this might help you understand where you are as far as... um, judgmentalism and legalism is in your life if you want to know kind of a barometer on where you are on that how do you respond that Jesus sits down with a woman an immoral woman who has a messed up life and Jesus engaged her in conversation if your Jesus won't talk to the immoral people of the world you've got the wrong Jesus if your Jesus cannot look into the heart of a woman like this and see her need and see her her, uh, need of having her life transformed by the power of the gospel. You've got the wrong Jesus. Jesus came into this world for people whose lives are messed up just like this woman's life 
was messed up. By the way, yours is that messed up, you just don't know it. Right? See, I, maybe I should have said this, maybe I should say it later. I don't know when I should say it, I just know I ought to say it. I'm in this text, and you are too. See, all of us are this woman. There we are, our lives are messed up. It may not be that you've, you've had five ruined marriages. It may not be that you're living in an in a immoral relationship with uh, someone. That, that may not be your exact sin. But you don't have to be guilty of the exact sin of this woman to be just as messed up as she was. So that is all of us. We're all in this text. Well, notice what Jesus saw in this woman. Number one, he saw her, so, he saw her social status. Her social status was that she was a Samaritan. That's bad news back then. In the first century, to be a Samaritan was bad news. The, the Samaritan was part Jew, but they 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 were uh, uh, they they were part uh, uh, Arab, and and so the Samaritans were looked upon by the True blood, blue blood Jews with great disdain. In fact, a Jew would not walk through a settlement where Samaritans were living. A Jew had no regard, no respect for a Samaritan. They would avoid them at all costs. They, uh, they, they would not show kindness, compassion, grace to any Samaritan. You know anybody like that? You, you know anybody that when you see them, you think, ah. You do everything you can to avoid them. You don't want to speak to them. You don't have to engage in conversation with them. You just kind of want to avoid them. Maybe their lifestyle is of such a nature that we think, oh, I couldn't be, I, I wouldn't be caught dead talking to somebody like that. Jesus would. So here's the Samaritan, but, but not only is there the issue of the fact that she is the Samaritan, but there's also the issue that she was a woman. And in that day, whether we like it or not, the reality is that in that day, a woman would be viewed as inferior. You know, I got to thinking about that this morning when I was praying and looking over. I don't understand why every woman in the world wouldn't love and want to be a follower of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus has done more for women than any politician could ever dream of doing? If you're a woman and an unbeliever, you ought to trust in Christ today. You ought to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, Jesus has done more for womanhood than anybody. So here's a Samaritan, unclean. Here's a Samaritan uh, uh, held in, in no regard whatsoever. Here's a woman. Yeah, she, she is inferior. And yet it is this kind of woman that Jesus engages in conversation. Can I just tell you this? Jesus loves the immoral people of the world. Jesus loves the ungodly people of the world. I don't mean to bust your bubble or hurt your feelings, but if it happens, I guess it just happens, all right? Jesus didn't love John any more than he loved this immoral woman. Jesus does not love your little grandson any more than he loves the drug pusher. You got that? I think sometimes we get the mistaken idea that because our sins are not exactly like that of somebody else that Jesus probably loves us a little bit. No, 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 no. Jesus does not love yours and mine because yours and mine are not guilty of the exact same sin of the abortionist, of the homosexual, of uh, those who are immoral, those who are involved in all kinds of gross sins. I'm telling you that if Jesus was here in the flesh, he would be going to those people, to those kind of people who are dealing with those kind of issues, and we are his feet, we are his hands, that's where we ought to go. Mm. That's what I thought. We like to hear that Jesus loves the immoral people, we just don't want to be the ones to go and tell them 
that he loves them. So what did Jesus see in this woman? Jesus saw her, her, her uh, social status. Uh, you notice Jesus saw also her sinful state. She was, she was Samaritan. She was a woman. But she was also a great sinner. In fact, you will notice in verse 16 that Jesus told her to go and tell her husband. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you got that right. You've had five and the one you're living with now is not your husband. You're living in sin. You're living in immorality. Can I just show you what's, what Jesus did not do? Y'all, Jesus did not read her the riot act and condemn her. He offered her the water of life. What, what, what are we doing? When, when it, we, we feel that somehow it is our responsibility to tell the sinner how bad off they are. It is our responsibility to tell the sinner where they can have their sins forgiven. We tell hungry men where they can find bread. We tell thirsty men where they can find water. That's why we exist. To tell people how they can be saved. So Jesus says... To this woman, I know, I know about you spiritually. I know about you socially. But notice what Jesus said to this woman. As Jesus began to talk to this Samaritan woman, the conversation started with water and then it went from water to worship. Jesus moved from the natural water to the spiritual, the water of life, quickly. For a while, the woman thought she was talking about literal water. And in this conversation, it becomes obvious that she comes back to this well over and over again. Because her, she can get water, she can take it home, but it doesn't satisfy her thirst long. It's not long until she becomes thirsty all over again. We understand that. That, that you can be thirsty now, you can have your thirst quenched, but, but it doesn't last long. And, and what a picture that was in so many ways of her life. She, she drinks water, but it doesn't satisfy permanently. She's got to have more water. That's kind of pictured in the way she was living her life. One man after the other. Well, what was wrong with him? Well, he didn't satisfy. Well, what was wrong here? It didn't satisfy. Now she's living in an immoral relationship, and it's not satisfying. It's like drinking water that, that does not satisfy and she goes from one illicit relationship to the other. She engages in one sin after the other. And there is no satisfaction. Maybe I'm speaking to one and you're trying to find the satisfaction and the meaning of life. If I could just find Mr. Right. If I could just find the right job. If I could just find the right environment. My whole life would be different. I'm telling you, your life is not different until you come to faith in Jesus Christ. What can satisfy my soul Nothing but Jesus. Stop looking here. Stop looking there. Stop going to that well and this well. They're all just alike. None of them have the power to satisfy the deepest need and the deepest longing of your heart. You know, sometimes young people, sometimes teenagers get up junior, senior in high school, go off to college and spread their wings so the while uh, trying to find satisfaction, trying to find the meaning and the purpose of life, trying to find happiness. I'm telling you, it's not in sin. It is in Jesus, God's Son. That's where it is. See, there's a part of you. Nicodemus didn't understand it. Can a man be born when he is old? This woman doesn't understand it. There's a part of you that is spiritual. It is the deepest part of you. And there is nothing in this world that can satisfy the longing that is in the deepest part of you. Only Jesus can satisfy that. So Jesus knew about her. By the way, can I just remind you, Jesus knows you. All the things that we think we have pushed down and hidden from everybody's view, Jesus sees them perfectly, clearly, openly. All those things that we think nobody knows about, Jesus knows about them perfectly, clearly, openly. So Jesus had a conversation with this woman. And Jesus tells her there is hope. And that hope is found in Christ. But then Jesus had a conversation not only with this woman. Jesus had a conversation with the disciples. So Jesus has conversed with this woman. 
the disciples come back and they are aghast. They are shocked. They are surprised. We can't believe it. Here we've gone into town to buy meat and we come back and we find our, our Messiah, our Lord, our Rabbi, our teacher. And, and not, only, not only do we find him resting, but we find him engaged in conversation with a Samaritan. Are you ready for this? Woman. Well, Jesus teaches us a lesson in all of this. They, they rebuke the Lord. What are you doing? What are you doing talking to the likes of her? Well, it's the likes of hers that brought Jesus out of the ivory palaces down to a cross. And notice what Jesus says to them in verse 32. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Well, they don't understand what's he talking about, meat to eat. Did somebody bring him something? Did, did he find something uh, uh, to eat that we didn't know anything about? Did he bring something with him that we didn't know anything about? What does he mean? He has meat to eat that you know not of. Well, look at it in verse 34. My meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Just as this woman had been thinking of literal water. The disciples now are thinking about literal food. And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about literal water to her. I'm talking about the water of life. I'm not talking about literal food here. That sustains the physical man, the outward man. Instead, the Lord says, I'm talking about something that is deeper than just the outward. I'm talking about the inward man. And he says, my meat, my food, that which sustains me is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Like these disciples. We're very often. Thinking about the physical. Way before the spiritual ever enters into our mind. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Some of you have already been thinking about. While I've been preaching by the way. Where are we going to eat lunch? Man, I wish Chick-fil-A was open on Sunday. (laughs) You haven't been thinking about whether anybody's going to get saved today or not. See, we think about the physical. We think about what we're going to put on. How's it going to, is this going to make me look whatever? Um, we, 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 We wonder think, meditate, spend money upon. We, we, we spoil the flesh. All the while, spiritually, we're dead in trespasses and sins. Can I just urge you this morning to take a few minutes to stop right now thinking about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Stop thinking about how you feel physically and just for a few minutes think about Your spirit, where are you going to spend eternity? Death will come, and then what? What about that piling amount, mountain of sin in your life? Are you going to let Jesus forgive you of that or not? What what about that that, uh, dissatisfied spirit that you have? What about running from one sin to the other, one relationship to the other, one drug to the other, one drink to the other? And yet there is never any satisfaction. Don't you think it's time that you gave thought? What is is this all about? How can it change? How can I move from misery into the joy of the Lord? How can I move from from living a futile life to living life that has purpose and meaning? It is all in Jesus. So, So Jesus says, no, 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 no. Get your mind off the physical. There's something more important than what you're going to eat for lunch. There's something more important than is your tie straight. And that which is more important is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus says to his disciples, no, 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 it's not about the physical. It is about the spiritual Jesus told them that's the kind of hunger you ought to have. Jesus talked about this kind of hunger 
in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Would your life right now as a Christian be any better? Would, would you be any closer to the Lord? Would there be any more spiritual fruit in your life right now, right now, if you hungered and thirsted after righteousness the way you do steak and baked potato? Would your life be any different? If you hungered and thirsted after righteousness the way you do pizza? You ever just crave pizza? You ever crave cheese fries? <clears throat> I'll stop. <laughs> Jesus said the strongest desire and craving that you ought to have is this craving, this desire. For righteousness. See, Jesus says that there, there's more to it than just the physical. There's more to it than just the flesh. What about the spiritual? But not only did Jesus talk to them about the hunger, Jesus also talked to them about the harvest. Notice, notice what the Lord said in, 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 in verse 35. He said, say not, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. I say to you, lift up your eyes. The harvest is, is already white. The fields are ready. Yeah, this woman who had been converted. This woman who was immoral, but now she's saved. This woman who was living uh, in, in immorality. Her life has been completely transformed by the power of Christ. You know what she did? She went into the city. And she said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Every once in a while, somebody will say, you know, I just can't be a witness for Christ. Well, I got news for you. You are one, whether you want to be or not. You may be a bad one, but you're a witness for Christ. Or you can be a good one, but you're a witness. Let me show you the simplicity of a witness. I don't think this woman knew anything about the theological terms of the day. I don't think this woman knew anything about apologetics and how to defend the faith I think this woman just knew one thing I met a man and he told me everything that I ever did and this has got to be the Messiah and I believe on him that was her testimony that was her witness I, I think about this she comes she goes into the city and, and 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 there she is telling the men of the city the people of the city come see a man reckon what those men those men must have thought about her uh-huh Reckon any of those immoral men had ever been with this immoral woman and now she's telling them, come see a man. And I'm going to tell you the power of her testimony is not only the truthfulness, the accuracy of her words, but added to that was the change that had taken place in her life. Come see a man. Come see a man. See, ladies and gentlemen, the problem today is not with the harvest. The problem is with the harvesters. The problem is not that the world is sinful. It's always been sinful, and we should not act surprised at that. The problem is that the church is letting a harvest spoil and rot in the field. Oh, it's not that we're not doing anything. We're doing plenty. We're quibbling over junk. It doesn't matter. We're quibbling over having arguments and debates over this and over that. And, and, and we're getting caught up in our own little uh, uh, kingdoms, our own little worlds. And Jesus is shouting from the portals of glory. What about the harvest? The harvest is great. It's quiet. It's right. We've got to move. And we've got to move now. And we've got to move efficiently. And we've got to do it with, with passion. The harvest is rotting in the field. And the church is saying, well, I, I don't, we better not do it that way. For God's sake, let's just do it. Right. So Jesus speaks to the woman, gives to her the water of life. Jesus speaks to the disciples and says, the harvest is a great. You know what Jesus is saying? There's a bunch more folk in the world just like her who's immoral, who's involved in all kinds of sin, but can be changed 
by the power of the gospel of Christ. Last of all, Jesus not only speaks to the woman and speaks to the disciples, but he speaks to the people. Started out rather with, this, this whole account started with a shady lady. And she met the Messiah. And her life is forever changed as a result of meeting Jesus. Your life will be changed too. If you would just come to Christ, if you would just believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God, your life would be forever changed. Oh, I know the arguments, but I'm a church member. Hey, I want to tell you, church members are in hell today. The only people not in hell are saved people. So the issue is not whether you're a church member. The issue is not whether you think you are a good neighbor, good husband. The issue is not whether you are a, think you are a moral person. The issue is, have you been to Jesus? Have you put your trust and faith in Him? Now look what he says in verse 28. Uh, the, the, the woman left her water pot and went into the city and, and said to the men, Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. She left her water pots behind. She goes into town and says, come see a man. Well, that's our story. See, our story doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to go through somebody's soul winning course to be a faithful witness for Jesus. You just have to tell them, come see a man. This is what Jesus did for me. This is what Jesus will do for you. If you've been changed by the power of the gospel, you've got something to tell a lost world. If, if the grace of God has changed you, forgiven you of all your sins, made you God's child, you've got a message to share. She said, come see a man. That is our story. Our story is the gospel. Our story involves a cross. Our, our story involves blood. The blood of the Lamb of God. Slain from the foundation of the world. We see our Lord there as He quivers on the cross. We see Him there as His head, His, his brow is crowned with thorns. We hear His faint voice as He cries from the pain and the agony of crucifixion. And then we want to become shy. Then we want to become somehow Come up with a million excuses of why we cannot be a faithful witness. We could never share the gospel. We could never tell somebody else how to be saved. I'm saying to you, in light of the blood-stained cross of Calvary, we've got to tell the world how they can be saved. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love. Beyond degree. That's our story. It is about sin. But it is about full and final payment for the sins of the world. It's about victorious resurrection. It's about grace and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be saved today. You can be saved regardless of your past. Regardless of the immorality that has marked your life. You can be saved today. Because Jesus Christ paid for your sins, and he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's all of us. So you can be saved by putting your trust and faith in Christ. Let, 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 let me show you something. Let me encourage you as we close. Look what the Bible says in verse 41. Uh, or in verse uh, 39, I'm sorry. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I did. She have any converts? You bet she did. And I don't mean arrogantly she had converts. I mean God used her message. And many believed because of her word. But now look at verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. See, John 3, there's Nicodemus. As far as we can tell, Nicodemus left that nighttime interview confused, much more confused than he was convinced. Here's this woman at the well, a woman, a Samaritan. And I like the way one writer put it when he said, 
And so what was hidden from the wise and understanding Nicodemus is revealed to these spiritual babes. And while scribes and Pharisees stand aside, the pagan world flocks into the kingdom of God. Jesus never fared well with the religious crowd, the aristocratic. Jesus fared well with sinners and Samaritans. See, that's what we all are today. We're all sinners. Oh, you may have more money than somebody else. You may be more educated than somebody else. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to what really matters is that we are all sinners in the sight of a holy God. And saying, I'm not the standard and no one else is the standard. Christ alone is the standard of righteousness. It doesn't matter if you're better than me. And I can see where you would say that you're better than me. You probably are. But the problem is not, you don't have to be better than me. Do you meet the standard of Jesus Christ? You don't. Therefore, you need to be saved. He came to save sinners. I love the words of Paul. Paul had been a believer many years when he wrote these words. This is a faithful saying. Get this. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I could have written those words and signed my name to them. You could have written those words and signed your name to them. We're all sinners. But this woman, nameless, faceless as she is, stands as an eternal testimony to the willingness and the power of the Lord Jesus to save old-fashioned sinners just like this woman. Won't you come to Jesus this morning? Won't you put your trust and faith in Christ? Acknowledge what you are, a sinner. Acknowledge what you need, forgiveness, salvation. And then come, come today believing, trusting In the Lord Jesus to save you. If you would just come to Jesus today. Believe on him. You'd be saved. Would you come? I want us to stand together and bow our heads. Our church is praying now. Praying for this time of invitation. Praying for you if you don't know the Lord. You come to Jesus. Believe on him and be saved. Listen to what he said. He said he that cometh to me. I will in no wise cast out. If you will come to Christ today, he'll receive you. He'll forgive you. He'll make you God's child. How about it today? Today's the day of salvation. What a day. What a day. What an opportunity for you right now to be saved. Come to Christ. Believe on him and be saved. Would you come? God's people are praying. As the Holy Spirit convicts you, would you come? If you have other spiritual needs this morning and you need to respond to God's invitation. Why don't you come? Our Father and our God, we thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you, Lord, for laying down your life so that we could have salvation. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your grace. And Father, we thank you that you love sinners and that Christ came to save sinners because that's all we are sinners. And Father, whether there's a person here today that's religious or a person here today that's considered to be immoral, we pray that they would come to Christ and receive eternal life. These things we ask in the name of Jesus.